This is Examine Sport, a podcast of the Sports Ethicist. I am your host, Sean Klein. Each episode of Examine Sport focuses on an argument or concept in the philosophy of sport literature. We will look at classic, discipline-defining articles, exciting, newly published works, and dig deep for important but not as well-known papers. You can subscribe, comment, and find an archive of all the shows, along with links and related information, at sportsethicist.com. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at What is a Game by Bernard Suits. This seemed like a logical place to start since it's one of the founding pieces for the philosophy of sport. Now, Bernard Suits was a professor of philosophy at the University of Waterloo and is best known for his classic 1978 book, The Grasshopper, Games, Life, and Utopia. Now, many of the main ideas in The Grasshopper were first presented a decade earlier in What is a Game? Published in Philosophy of Sport in 1967, the article has one simple goal, to present a definition of game playing. The definition Suits defends in this article, with remarkably few adjustments, quickly became and remains the standard in the philosophy of sport. It wasn't the first such attempt, nor was it the last, but it probably is the most influential and not just in the philosophy of sport. Suits' definition even shows up in books about computer game designs. So here is the definition. To play a game is to engage in activity directed toward bringing about a specific state of affairs using only means permitted by specific rules, where the means permitted in the rules are more limited in scope than they would be in the absence of the rules and where the sole reason for accepting such limitation is to make possible such activity. Now, Suits gets to this definition by progressively working through six claims about the nature of game playing. As he explains and critiques each of these, he gets closer to finding the key elements for his definition. Before going into these six claims, it's important to note that Suits slides between defining game and defining game playing, between defining the object, the thing we call a game, and defining the activity, the action of playing a game. Now, the title of the article is, What is a Game? And the elements of the definition are often presented as essential characteristics of game. However, Suits explicitly says in the introduction, he is proposing, quote, to formulate a definition of game playing, And the definiendum of his proposed definition is to play a game. Suits, at least in his early work on games, doesn't seem to notice this slide. Nor is it clear we can define game and game playing without each other. But if we don't pay attention to this potential hybrid nature of the concept of game, that it involves both activity and a thing, a verb and a noun aspect, we miss getting a full account of the concept but also it might lead to various problems in terms of how the concept gets applied and discussed. For example, if we rely too heavily on the thingness of games, we miss important psychological and attitudinal elements of games. But if instead we focus on those attitudinal elements, we might end up applying the concept inappropriately to non-game activities in which participants might share a game-like attitude. There's more to be said on this, but that'll have to wait until future episodes. Let's now look at the six theses about game playing that Suits examines. Game playing as the selection of inefficient means, the inseparability of rules and ends in games, game rules as not ultimately binding, means rather than rules as non-ultimate, rules are accepted for the sake of activity that uh, that make it possible, Winning is not the end with respect to which rules limit means. Well, let's take a look at the first thesis, game playing as the selection of inefficient means. Suit starts with the common and frequent presumption that work and playing games are different. Whatever else one might say about games, playing games is not work. As Suit says, quote, 
Games, therefore, might be expected to be what work, in some salient respect, is not. So what is work? He defines that as, an act, quote, an activity in which an agent seeks to employ the most efficient available means for reaching a desired goal. You get the job done as quickly and effectively as you can. Playing games, then, might be thought to be activities in which less efficient means are chosen. Using Suit's example of a track race, instead of just running across the infield of a track to arrive at the finish line in the most efficient manner possible, one voluntarily goes, voluntarily goes all around the track in a less efficient manner. Now, although this idea of inefficiency and the difference between play and work remains a part of Suits' conception of games, he does reject this first thesis. It doesn't capture what goes on in a game. Once the game is engaged, players do commit themselves to the most efficient means to achieve the ends of the game. Right? The, the, once you're in that track race, you run as fast as you can uh, right, uh, to get to the finish line as fast as possible within the permitted rules. Right? Those means, though, are constrained and set by the rules of the game. So the selection of inefficient means doesn't really define or capture the nature of game playing in itself. The second thesis, the inseparability of rules and ends in games. From this idea that rules constrain and set the means available in games, we see something important about the nature of rules in games. To play the game is to follow the rules. If one is not playing according to the rules of the game, then in some sense, they are not playing the game. At least not that game. Maybe they are playing a different game with a different set of rules. But if so, they have to be following the rules of that game. As Suits says, to break a rule is to render impossible the attainment of an end. Cheaters never win because winning only comes about by playing the game, and cheaters, by breaking the rules, are not playing the game and so logically cannot win. The rules and ends are inseparable in that one cannot achieve the end of the game without following the rules. Suits doesn't reject this inseparability, but he does reject this thesis as defining game playing on the basis that it's too broad. As his examples of Professor Snooze and Professor Threat demonstrate, it doesn't apply only to games. You can save Snooze and want to save Snooze, but you have a moral rule against killing of any kind. In such a, in, in such a case, your end, saving su Snooze, is inseparable from the moral rules that guide your behavior. You refuse to kill Professor Threat, and so you're unable to save Snooze. Now, this is not a game, but involves similar conditions of the inseparability of rules and ends. Thus, the thesis is too broad to be our definition. The third thesis, game rules as not ultimately binding. Now, here, Seuss wonders, how can we narrow it down so we aren't sweeping in activities like Snooze, in, in, like us trying to say snooze in a moral way that are not game playing. So in thesis three, he looks at what seems to be an important difference between the way that rules bind us in games and the way things like moral rules bind us. The rule against killing is considered a moral rule that is binding in some ultimate way. Game rules, though, are always in some important way not ultimate. The commitment to the game rules is not ultimate. Other rules, like no killing, supersede the game rules. Now, this would work to narrow things down to exclude cases like snooze and threat. But Snoots argues it narrows too much. He offers a counterexample that, uh, counterexamples that are supposed to show that it is possible to have a supreme commitment to a game. For example, a race car driver who is so committed to his game that he runs over a child that has wandered onto the track. The driver is condemnable, but he is condemnable precisely because he treats the rules of the game as ultimate, as having priority over morality. Now, one might say, though, that playing games has to be non-ultimate, that to make the game ultimate means it's no longer a game. Now, Suits argues that this begs the question. This is precisely what is at issue, and it cannot just be assumed. Moreover, Suits points out, it is a game which is being taken as ultimate. A worry I want to raise here is that Suits might be begging the question the other way. 
The issue is whether games can be of supreme importance, so we can't assume that if the activity is taken as having supreme importance, then it's not a game. But at the same time, it seems like we can't assume that what the person is treating as ultimate is indeed still the game. That is, we shouldn't assume that because the race car driver takes his race as ultimate that he's not playing a game, but equally we should be wary of assuming that because normally driving a race car is a game, that the driver is playing a game. This might be a case where the slide discussed earlier between game and game playing might be important. Car racing might be a game, but the race car driver in this example might not be playing a game. In the end though, Suits is right to reject this thesis as defining games. As we can see, it can't differentiate the, act the activity for us without already knowing, in some sense, what games are. The fourth means rather than rules as non-ultimate. Suits doesn't jettison the idea of games as being non-ultimate in some sense. He argues in this section that it is means, not the rules, that have a kind of non-ultimacy. What he means is that the means available to the game player are more limited than they would otherwise be outside of the structure and rules of the game. The game means are restricted and non-ultimate in the sense that if one was trying to accomplish the end, period, independent of a game, the means wouldn't be as restricted. They are restricted for the purpose of the game. For example, there are many ways to get over a high jump bar, but if one is playing a game, a game of high jump, one restricts his means, for example, refusing to use a ladder. The available means are restricted for the sake of the game. Now, Suits doesn't reject this thesis number four, but he sees it as incomplete. Why accept these means restricted by the rules? And here we get to thesis five. The rules are accepted for the sake of the activity that make it possible. This naturally moves us to this thesis. Why accept limitations? In a game, the rules and limitations they introduce are accepted because the acceptance and conformity to the rules is necessary for the game to exist. We might accept other rules and limitations for some external reason, to be a good person, for example. In games, though, the rules are accepted to make the activity possible. As Suits says, in morals, conformity to the rules make the action right, but in games, it makes the action. Now Suits is getting to his definition, closer to his definition here, but there's one more difficulty he wants to address. So we get to the sixth uh, thesis, winning is not the end with respect to which uh, rules limit the means. Suits worries that if we stop here, we run into a confusion about how we limit means. The rules limit the means permitted in the game. Winning is defined by achieving, via these restricted means, the goal of the game. But we can't then use the goal of winning to guide the restricting of the means without running in a circle. We need some other end that we are aiming at to, to achieve by the restricted means. The other end is some state of affairs one is trying to achieve, the immobilized king on the chessboard, the crossing of a finish line, the rescuing of Pauline. The game rules set the limitation on the means to achieve those goals. Winning is then defined as the achievement of this state of affairs within the defined rules and limited means. And this allows us to put this all together into his definition, which we looked at before, to play a game is to engage in an activity directed toward bringing about a specific state of affairs using only means permitted by specific rules, where the means permitted by the rules are more limited in scope than they would be in the absence of the rules, and where the sole reason for accepting such limitation is to make such activity possible. Now, Suits makes uh, a few changes to this definition in his later works, uh, relatively minor changes, uh, uh, and, and we'll talk about those in later episodes. But I think it is notable about how little his definition changes as he develops and applies his theory of games in later works. Thank you for listening to Examine Sport. You can subscribe, comment, and find an archive of all the shows along with links and related information at sportsethicist.com. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or email the show sportsethicist at gmail.com.